So welcome to our Wednesday weekly webinar. And today's guest speaker is going to be Tom Kelb. He's located out in Bismarck, and he's a horticulture specialist in plant science. And before we get started officially, I'm going to do a quick advertisement. Please join us for upcoming webinars every week, same time, same link. Uh, next week, it's going to be Actually, Todd Weinman is going to fill in for Kim Halloway because she's taken or she's left the state for another state. And then we have Esther coming up and Glenn Muskie and several others. So please uh, join us. A few logistics in case some of you are new to this system. Uh, we've been using the chat pod, of course. Um, if you have a question, and we'll try to take all the questions for sure at the end, there's a little pod, and you see number five has a place where you can type in your question. And of course, you can always follow up with any of us afterwards. Uh, there will be a short survey at the very end, and I believe Bob is going to also send those out as part of our system that we do. It's very short. We really need your, your input because this was funded by a grant. And it's, you also have the opportunity to win a prize and print out a certificate. So we tried to make it worth your while. It will take you two minutes. And visit our Field of Fork website. It's a work in progress, and new resources continue, be, continue to be added. So check that out. We're adding new things all the time. And now I'm going to turn it over to Tom. Thanks, Tom. I'm glad you made it. Yeah, thanks, Julie. I, like you say, you never know with computers. And my computer wanted to do a series of updates here at the last second. And so I was scrambling around trying to make it stop updating so I can get on with you guys. But it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And today we're going to talk about 10 steps to a fantastic vegetable garden. We've got the spring fever now. It's warm, and there's a lot of interest now in getting the garden going. Today I'm going to talk about how we can have a, a productive garden. And the other thing that we're going to emphasize is how we can work smart in the garden. Not work hard, but work smart. And our goal is to have lots of delicious vegetables that are um, healthy, nutritious, and we will talk about minimizing the use of toxic pesticides in our garden because we just don't want to be eating toxic vegetables. Um, also, I want to say that I like informal talks, and so I welcome your questions at any time. And um, so don't be shy. And I'll pause a couple times during the talk. And some of the steps, there's 10 steps. Some steps will take a few minutes. Some will take a few more. But uh, we're going to have a good time this afternoon. So let's get started. Here we go with our vegetable garden. And the first step to a great garden is you got to put your garden in the right location. And I think there's three important elements here. One is we want a sunny site. To have a great garden, we've got to have full sun at least eight hours of the day. Okay, We need lots of sun, um, especially with any of the flowering vegetables. And most are. We're talking about tomatoes and peppers, uh, eggplant, beans and peas, corn. They all have flowers, and they all need lots of sun. If you have a more shady spot in a garden, you can put your leafy or your root vegetables in that area of the garden. But we want lots of sun to have a productive garden. The other thing I want to talk about is water. Watering is the most limiting factor as far as yields in North Dakota. We are in a semi-arid state. It is dry here. And for those of us who aren't raised in North Dakota, we have, I appreciate how dry it can be here some of the summers. So if we want to have a productive garden, we have to have access to water. That's important. But as far as drainage goes, we don't want too much water, right? So we want to make sure everything is well drained. And a garden like this will uh, maximize drainage, being here in a square foot type of garden. Today I was asked to talk a little bit about square foot gardens, and so let's do it right now. Um, does anybody know who this garden god is? 
You can just type it in if you want. Wow. Okay. This is the this is the a lot of shy people out there. You can't remember, but you read his book. There you go. Where you go, Todd? Todd, you win the special prize. Mel Bartholomew. Scared for square foot speed. No. Mel, it's Mel Bartholomew. Uh, the Square Foot Garden God, and he wrote, um, he's got the number one best-selling book for years. No, that's not Esther. Uh, no. Um, Mel Bartholomew, and he's got a book about square foot gardens, and he talks about how it's a, a revolutionary way to grow to maximizing yields in a small space. You know, um, I, there's nothing revolutionary about square foot gardens. People have been uh, growing their vegetables in raised beds since prehistoric times, but nevertheless, uh, he, he uh, put the spin on putting some lumber around the bed, uh, divide everything in the square foot area, and then sell a book on it. And I do, a lot of people here like the book. Me too. When I put in my first square foot garden, I use this as my resource, and I, I recommend this as one of the resources for us. I always kid about Mel that he has, he's the only gardener I know who has white pants, so he never gets dirty in his garden. And Mel's idea talks about how you can divide your garden into square feet, you know, little square foot plots, and it kind of makes sense. Like if you look on the right, you can grow 16 radishes in a square foot, but on the left, you can see like he thinks you can grow a watermelon and a two square foot plot. I don't know how true, or a pumpkin. I don't know about that. I've never saw a pumpkin vine grow only about two feet, but I guess you can let it just trail over the edge of the plot and uh, or trellis it up. But you get the principle. The principle is make every square inch count in the garden. Okay, raised bed gardens do have a, a couple of a few benefits here. The first one's it's clean and aesthetic, and that's why how Mel can have white pants and still have a great garden. Um, it's also easy on the back, a raised bed garden, because you don't have to bend down as far, right? So that's really a benefit, especially for those of us who are over the hill and we don't quite bend as easily as we used to. Another nice benefit about raised bed gardens is it has no compaction, and that's because we don't step on the ground, okay? We can just reach across the garden. We don't have to step over the garden. Raised bed gardens have great drainage, and being raised, they warm up quickly, and usually we have fewer weed problems in square foot gardens, because, you know, one thing is that every inch is covered by a plant, so the weeds, the emerging weeds can be smothered out, and um, I also find that just if the, the, the young weeds pull out very easily, okay? And also, weeds won't be creeping in from the turf. They'd have to climb over the raised bed. So we have fewer weed problems. So I highly recommend raised beds for gardens. It's a, it's a great technique. Okay, now let's talk about some of the major issues with, with uh, raised bed or square foot gardens. And one of them has to do with the use of pressure-treated lumber. There's a lot of misinformation about pressure-treated lumber. Um, the pressure tree lumber used in the past is chromated copper arsenate, CCA, okay? CCA um, was, was, was safe to use in a, in a square foot garden or a raised bed garden. It was uh, a reasonable use of it. There is, there's no instances where anybody got poisoned by the use of pressure treated lumber. Nevertheless, the manufacturers decided that it wasn't worth the, the grief because, you know, the, the, the word arsenic and, and vegetables just is a bad combination, right? No, arsenic and food, you don't like to put that together. So in 2002, the manufacturers started pulling this off the shelves, and you'll have a hard time finding CCA-treated lumber for residential use. It's pretty much limited now to the use of like using it on marine docks or maybe on a on a deck, but you can have a hard time finding CCA treated lumber for residential use. And on the label it says, avoid intimate human contact with the wood. Okay, so I don't know how you feel about that. 
I love gardening, but I would never make love to my my lumber in the garden. But uh, I guess what they're talking about there is when you use this type of lumber, sometimes it's used for like a handrail. So like people keep rubbing it when they walk down the steps. So don't use it for a handrail. But you know, this is a problem of the past. It wasn't even a problem to begin with, but it's a problem of the past. Today, the type of lumber you're going to see if you go to a lumber store for residential use is ACQ lumber, alkaline copper quaternary lumber. And what they what they did is they just boosted up the copper. So it's recommended as an alternative material for vegetable gardens, and it contains no chemicals that are considered toxic by the EPA, okay? So this is non-toxic wood. There's nothing to be scared about with pressure treated lumber. Just make sure it's the, the modern lumber, and that'd be likely ACQ lumber. Okay, so I highly recommend the use of pressure treated lumber in vegetable gardens. Other choices, you can use cedar. Cedar's natural, but, and it, it lasts a long time, but it's very expensive. Um, several times more expensive than pressure treated lumber and you know unless you're really rich it's just not uh, I just don't think it's that cost effective frankly and uh, I think we want to make our garden affordable I, I you hear about these people who do put all these gadgets in their garden they end up when they when they harvest their ultimate crop you have like a, a sixty four dollar tomato that they grew Okay, we don't want that. We want our gardens to save us money, not cost money. Untreated pine is another option, and, and that's perfectly uh, natural, perfectly safe, but it does have a short life. You know, maybe you'll get a few years out of it. Then lastly, railroad ties are the other common use for raised beds. The problem with railroad ties is they are treated with a toxic material, creosote typically, and um, you just you know, they say you can use it if it's aged railroad ties, but it's really hard to determine how, at what age is the railroad tie safe now. So in general, I do not recommend using railroad ties for vegetable gardens. I recommend them for use in um, use of landscape flowers or in shrubs, but not in a vegetable garden. If you are at all concerned about any of these toxin materials, you can always line the inside of your raised bed with plastic, you know, some black plastic, and that will serve as a, a barrier to prevent any possible toxins from getting into your plant, into your vegetable garden. Okay, here's an example. I saw Michelle Efforts was on, and here's Michelle in one of her uh, junior master garden gardens, a nice raised bed garden. And if you see that boy on the left with a green shirt there, that's one of our um, target audience, you know, the boy who's eating a upside down bag of Doritos there and kind of confused looking at a, a broccoli plant for the first time in his life, doesn't know what a vegetable is. And so this is, um, I really salute Michelle and all our county agents who are putting up these junior master garden gardens out there and uh, making a difference, getting our kids to eat vegetables. And that's a big problem we have here in North Dakota. This guy in the green shirt, he's a typical North Dakotan. 92%, 92% of our kids do not eat enough vegetables for a healthy diet. That's just, wow, that's just amazing. That's unacceptable. And the problem is they take after their parents, and it's about 75% of adults in our state do not eat enough vegetables for a healthy diet. So anything we can do to encourage raised bed gardening and a healthy diet, it's a good thing. Here's just, an, I'll just throw out another example of a raised bed garden. I did this one several years ago, and um, you could see how it's just very simple. You just all you have to do is get some lumber and some deck screws. You're ready to rock and roll. And usually, what we do is we use eight foot boards, and we cut them in half so it's four foot width, eight foot long. And here's here's a bed I did in Wisconsin, and um, put a fence up to keep the deer out and the, and the dogs in the park out. And it was a is a great garden for kids. I had over a hundred kids in this garden. And the problem is the first year 
we didn't use raised beds, and they were just stepping all over the onions and everything. So we decided to put in these raised beds so we have nice rows. And uh, again, this is really a nice, uh, successful way to have gardens, including youth gardens. A few questions that I often get for this is, how deep should the garden be? And six to eight inches is deep enough for a raised bed garden. You don't have to go deeper than that. You're not really getting much benefit. How wide should the square foot garden be? It should be no more than four feet wide, OK? Because most people can reach two feet. So you can get on one side of the garden, reach two feet, get on the other side of the garden and find two feet. Then the other thing you can do is as far as spacing goes, we'd like to have at least three feet of ground between the square foot beds to allow for people to walk or wheelbarrows to get through. And as far as landscape fabric, landscape fabric is not necessary at the bottom of a raised bed. In fact, I usually I do not use landscape fabric because I don't want a barrier between the native soil and my uh, normal soil for their square foot garden. Does any, and as far as the soil itself, uh, you know, potting soil is the perfect mix for this, but you can make up your own home blend. I typically talk to a, a professional landscapers or a co landscape contractor, and I get um, a bulk amount of soil brought to the site, and I mix about 75% of topsoil with about 25% of peat, of peat moss. So that's what I use. How about I just uh, pause right here, and does anybody have any questions about square foot gardening or about what I've covered so far in the past? Okay, hearing none, we're going to march on. Next thing. Another key to a great, fantastic garden is soil. And we're from a rural state. We know, as you know, from farms that if you want to have a great farm, you got to have great soil. Same with the garden. If we want to have a productive garden, we got to have great soil. So we want at least four inches of topsoil. That's what we got to have. Should we do a soil test? That's a good question. And my general uh, belief on this. Um, is that if there's anything mysterious going on in your garden and you're just not you're not having optimal growth, it's worth the investment to get a soil test. It costs eighteen dollars to get a soil test, and that can unlock the secrets and find out how we can make our garden even more fertile. Um, so, so I highly recommend it. So, to think about it. You know, a good garden can produce hundreds of dollars of produce. So an $18 soil test is definitely worthwhile. And then I think uh, one of the best things you can add to your soil is organic matter. Then comes the question, what organic matter? I think if I just had to take one type of organic matter, I would highly recommend sphagnum peat moss for North Dakota gardens. And that's, uh, it, like other organic materials, it will improve the structure of the soil. It will improve the fertility of the soil. It will, it will help the soil to hold on to water when water is limited, but also it will improve drain, drain, drainage to allow water to flow out in case there's too much water. So it's just a great material. And I like sphagnum peat moss because it also will acidify the soil. And that most of our soils in North Dakota are alkaline. So a little bit of extra acid will help bring it right to the sweet spot where we can have optimal plant growth. So I like, I can recommend one inch of sphagnum peat moss to a garden or two inches and mix it in or for a raised bed maybe up to 25 percent. And mix that in and you'll have a beautiful quality soil. Another material that people often use is manure. And I just want to say that one thing to be concerned about with manure nowadays is you got to know the source of the manure because a lot of uh, a lot of pastures now are being sprayed with herbicides, and some of these are persistent herbicides. And so, if a horse like this eats grass from a herbicide-treated pasture, or if he eats herbicide-treated hay, 
then that herbicide, the animal will consume it, the herbicide will go right, will pass right through the animal without breaking down, and then when it poops it out, it'll have the herbicide in the poop. And so there you go. When you spread that manure out, you'll be spreading manure that's just laced with herbicide, and it's the pyridine herbicides that are a concern. And I'll get the question again this year. I'll have some callers come in and talk about how their tomatoes have some unusual curling or their beans and peas. They're very sensitive to these pyridine herbicides, and they can persist in, in gardens for years. So that's really a sad situation. So know where your manure is coming from, and be wary of herbicide-treated pastures. Tom, you have a couple questions in the chat. Okay, here we go. Michelle, if you build a tall raised bed, 20 inches high, right, okay, as far as, yes, Michelle, the answer is yes. Um, that's still a good way to go, or if you wanted to, you, I mean, the quote, one question is why you want to build it 28 inches high. Okay, just, if you're just trying to save your back, Sometimes people, you could fill in anything underneath, the, let's say, the top, the bottom 16 inches. You know, I just, I, I can't see any reason why you would put um, anything expensive all the way 20 inch, 28 inches down. So could you, I've heard of people put styrofoam peanuts in it. I've heard people put rocks in it, you know, anything. Or that's another thing, Mary, a good comment. Sometimes people actually have it on legs. But... Uh, as far as that key area where the where the vegetables are growing, a mixture like that, let's say say 75% topsoil and then 25% organic matter, you'll have good success with that. Okay, in that key, let's say again eight inches, but really six eight inches is all you need of good quality soil. Good question. Do you still need a? Uh, Alice has a question. Do we still need a gas tiller or is it? A gas tiller, I think you mean like a rotor tiller for a square foot garden? No, you don't need to. You don't need to use a rotor tiller for a square foot garden. You're just going to be. Uh, oh, a lot of people don't do anything, but if you want to just, you know, gently loosen the soil, then that'll, that'll just work just fine. The, the ground, you're, nobody's stepping on it. It's not going to be compacted ground. Any other questions about? Anything else going on? And of course, I, okay, I guess, Julie, we've shut off their microphones, I guess. So that's, okay, here's another thing. I've seen deep beds like that using branches. Yeah, any type of bulky material. Good. I like Annie. I appreciate that comment. Anything to fill up the deep beds. Yep, the whole key is that, that upper layer, upper eight inches. Okay, well, I'm going to keep moving. And let me just uh, throw in a little philosophy in here also, is that um, the best thing you can give your garden doesn't come out of the, a bag, like a fertilizer bag. It doesn't come out of the rear end of an animal. The best thing you can give your garden is your shadow. That's the best thing you can give your garden because the best gardeners will have a relationship with their garden. They're going to be out there in their garden. They're going to cast their shadow on their plants. They're going to see when their plants are thirsty. They're going to see when their plants look a little pale and might need some fertilizer. Or they're going to see that first outbreak of aphids on the plants. So uh, the Native Americans, I've heard they have a saying, the best thing you can give your garden are your footprints. That's the best thing. So it's the same philosophy. It's like spend time out in your garden and uh, enjoy it and you'll have a better garden. And you can do what you want. You can sing to it. You can pray to it. You can talk to it, whatever you want. Just have a relationship with your garden. Okay, that's all the philosophy I have for today, though. Okay, now let's keep moving here. The next thing is if you want to have a great garden, you've got to have great cultivars, great cultivated varieties. All right, and because if you have bad seeds, if you've got bad varieties, it doesn't matter how much, how good the soil is or how good you are at watering. If you've got bad seeds, then you're going to be limiting the, the production of your garden. So when I look for, for cultivars in North Dakota, I look for something that's early. 
That's the most important word in North Dakota. Our growing season is so short. It's anything that says more than 100 days in a catalog, I flip the page. Forget about it. Um, we want a cultivar that's high yielding. We want a, a cultivar that resists diseases, so we don't have to be spraying fungicides. And we want something with outstanding flavor, maybe something distinct that we can't buy at the grocery store. But it's got to have great flavor. Otherwise, what's the point? And I, I can think of only one exception to this, and that is Swiss chard. Swiss chard is disgusting. It's the worst tasting vegetable there is. Um, I know there's probably one or two of you out there who will argue about this, and then I find out about how you cook it. Yeah, you probably f fry it with about five pounds of bacon, add some garlic, and then it's tolerable. Um, but personally, I think this clover looks more appetizing than Swiss chard. But still, it's beautiful in a garden. This is part of my, uh, yeah, there you go. Here's part of my research team testing out different cultivars, one of my boys and girls. And they're doing what I call a snowflake test. And that is a cultivar has to ripen before the snow falls. And that's around, that, and this time it was mid-September in Bismarck. I want to give you a heads up that we do test cultivars in backyards. And we've worked with over 800 Households across North Dakota testing promising varieties, and you've got this handout available, I think. Um, these are the proven performers in North Dakota. And if you'd like to join our research team, these are, it's a fun project. We'll be off, we'll hope to launch this next week. And again, every year we'll work with over 200 families testing out all kinds of uh, vegetables, herbs, and flowers in their backyards. Simple, simple experiments. Usually we compare a new variety with uh, a new promising variety versus one that's um, reliable and we currently recommend. So we want, we want to discover the new varieties. Okay. I'll just go over a few varieties here. One is, well, I think, who knows what this is? Who knows what, what, what type of vegetable this is? Any courageous people out there? The most common guess I get is current tomatoes or cherry tomatoes. But the answer is no. This is asparagus. This is asparagus. And you may not know this, but there are male asparagus and female asparagus plants. And this is a female because it produces offspring. It produces seeds. And the females live a balanced life. They produce seeds and they also produce spears. But the seeds take a lot of energy out of those plants. And so that's why if we want to have just spears, we want the all-male varieties. What I call them the Jersey Boys from New Jersey, like Jersey Giant, Jersey Knight, Jersey Supreme. So if you want to maximize yield in asparagus, we've got all-male varieties now available to you. Another thing is there's all kinds of beans out there this year. There's pr magic purple beans that will turn green when you cook them. And that kids love that, see that magic. And it's a good way to trick kids to like beans. If I had a recommended type of bean for you to try, I'd encourage you to try filet beans. Filet beans. These are long, slender beans of optimal quality. And I would say the variety Crockett is really outstanding, but you know, just explore a little bit. Likewise with corn, there's super sweet varieties of corn now that are three times sweeter than what we had when we were kids. I remember this when I was a, when I was a kid on our farm. I'd pick corn the night before, and then I'd drive down to the Minneapolis farmers market to sell the corn the next morning. You know, I had one day to sell that corn. After one day, that corn was cow feed. It wasn't any good. Um, but nowadays we have corn that's much sweeter and that will stay sweet longer. So explore those super sweet types. And specific cultivar names are listed in the handout you have. Cucumbers. Wow, there's just so many amazing burpless cucumbers that are much more productive, much more higher quality than the standard, let's say, straight eights that are commonly grown here in North Dakota, and Tasty Greens are great. This question about GMO corn, and I appreciate that question. I want to make, that's a great topic. Let's be clear that it's going to be, it's almost impossible for a gardener to grow a GMO variety if they don't want to. Because for you to grow a GMO, 
Well, first of all, it's rare for a seed catalog to offer a GMO. It's very rare. It has to be one that's, it's most likely going to be in sweet corn if it is. Um, but for you to grow a GMO, you have to sign a contract ahead of time, and it talks about how you can grow the corn, how you have to isolate the planting, how you have to cultivate the planting after you're done producing the corn. So don't worry about GMO corn. Don't, I mean, unless you, you have to make a special effort that, yes, I want to grow GMO corn for you to grow GMO corn. You can't grow GMO corn accidentally. Okay, it's you. It's just it just can't be. It just you, you're not allowed to, even if you wanted to. You have to sign. You have to sign an agreement ahead of time. Okay, so don't worry about GMOs in the garden. That's a whole not not, not necessarily that they're bad or not, but I just say you don't have to worry about it. Green uh, lettuce. Most of our trials, the gardeners love romaine lettuce. Give that a shot. You'll really be pleased. Green forest is a great variety. Uh, cantaloupe, I have to say our, our growing season is cool here and it's hard to grow any type of melon. Athena is the most reliable variety. If you want to grow a honeydew, forget it. You're most likely going to fail. But there are Galea melons that are very flavorful and you can make it, you can grow successfully here in North Dakota. Try it. Even if you are uh, a remedial gardener who can grow almost nothing, you can grow an Asian or a Korean sun jewel melon. This is the easiest melon to grow, super early, super productive, and it's white inside. It kind of tastes, it reminds you of pears when you eat it. So I'm kind of just throwing out ideas here of ways that you can explore your garden. You know, get away from just stuff you buy at the grocery store but explore some of these varieties or cultivars that are out there that you can successfully grow in our harsh North Dakota climate. Um, watermelons, again, in our trials, when I hand out watermelon seed, I know half of the trials are going to be a failure. But if I had to pick one cultivar for North Dakota, it would be Sweet Dakota Rose. It's developed in North Dakota. It was bred in North Dakota. It's the most flavorful watermelon we can grow in our state, Sweet Dakota Rose. But again, I, I tell you to explore. I would try a yellow watermelon and have some fun. Yellow watermelons are even easier to grow than red ones. So a yellow flesh watermelon like early moonbeam, that's a, you'll have success with that and something special out of your garden. For winter squash, uh, most people who love winter squash will tell you that buttercup winter squash is the best tasting winter squash. And buttercup winter squash originated in North Dakota. My Lord, we're famous for our buttercup squash. And Burgess is the most widely grown variety. So if I could tell you to grow one winter squash, grow a buttercup. Okay, I see Ann has a comment of cream, a Saskatchewan watermelon. Great. A white flesh watermelon. So um, something different, but I, I've never grown it, but I heard you've got to be really careful with that one. It's got a very thin rind and breaks easily. So, but again, that's a great one to try. Thank you, Ann, for that comment. Tomatoes, there's all kinds of tomato cultivars. And there's a lot of interest in heirlooms. And I have to say, I just am not a fan of heirlooms. I, I think, you know, there's a reason why an heirloom is an heirloom. And that's because we've made progress. You know, I didn't come to work today in a horse and buggy. I drove a car. It's called progress. And same with heirloom tomatoes. Heirlooms are very susceptible to disease. Um, almost all require extensive pruning, trellising. Almost all are low yielding, um, very hard to grow. So I would say if you want to grow an heirloom, do it, but expect to fail. Okay, so that, we, so that means if you expect to fail, then that means if you get anything, any of these cracked tomatoes, you'll like it. Now, the good thing about heirlooms is that they do have um, amazing flavor. Okay, so the few tomatoes you get, will be very flavorful, but again, there's 
definitely not reliable. And if we're looking for reliable, I recommend a determinate cultivar. And there's several out there, let's say like Celebrity. And there's semi-determinates out there like Mountain Fresh Plus. But a determinate cultivar, it has a short, compact vine. You don't even, you don't have to, you don't have to prune them. You don't prune them. And you don't even have to trellis them if you don't want to. This is Roma, again, one of the easiest to grow of all tomatoes. And um, the nice thing about a determinate cultivar is generally it's early. And also, besides being early, it has a concentrated fruit set. So this is different than the indeterminate types, which are popular in other parts of the United States because they have an extended harvest season. But there's no need for an extended harvest season for us because we don't. It's because we have we have snow in September, so there's we're not going to we're not going to benefit from most in, indeterminate types. So if I just had to give a general recommendation. I look for determinate cultivars. And yes, Gene, I am a pessimist. Thank you for that comment. I am, I am many, many years of frustration to trying exploring all these new varieties. And yes, some are utter failures. Every year is a joy, though. Let me just throw one other thing here about tomatoes, and that is if you do grow tomatoes on a big scale, I want you to at least get introduced to the spring weave system. This is a, a system of trellising that most gardeners aren't aware of, but it's, it's, a, it's a nice, easy way to develop a wall of tomato vine and keep the tomato vine off the ground. You pound a stake about every two plants, and then you, you wrap twine, nylon twine, around the plants, supporting the plants. OK, question from the United Tribes. Yes, on a seed pack of tomatoes, it will definitely say if the cultivar is determinate or indeterminate. Also, if you look at a, a seed catalog, it will state determinate or indeterminate types. And there are some good, there's some, there's there are good, good indeterminates too. But just if I just had to give you a general recommendation or just a, a most likely successful approach, I would use a determinate type. Okay, any other? Questions about varieties, cultivars, or let's say tomato, anything before we move on? Okay, let's keep going here. And I, a lot of these steps are going to go quicker now. We want to maximize space in a great garden. One way to maximize space is to have a multi-crop. Grow more than one crop in the, in the spot. So let's say in spring, we can plant our spinach and then harvest the spinach in the early spring and then we plant our tomatoes afterwards, you know, in late May, early June, or that's when we can sow our cucumber seeds. Or on the other hand, we could have an early crop, let's say, or, or like, be, like peas, and then when that's all fried from the summer sun, we can plant our spinach for the fall in that area. Another way is to intercrop, and that is put plants within other plants. And you know, radishes and onions are good for that. So for example, let's say we in our garden, we'll plant our cucumbers about five feet apart. Our rows are five feet apart. What we can do is we, don't, we can take advantage of that extra space between the vines by putting in a quick planting of radishes or onions. Then we'll harvest that in the early summer just when the cucumber vines start to fill in. So that's intercropping, planting between the rows. And then also, we talked about growing vertical. And that's a great way to have long, straight cucumbers is <clears throat> grow vertically. Another step that's important is proper watering. We want to avoid overhead irrigation. Oh, this is terrible to see this. I hate to see this because what's happening here is the leaves are going to get wet and they're going to be subject to diseases. We want to avoid overhead irrigation. The plants drink through their roots, so let's water the roots. Let's water in the morning. That's the best time because it, we water in the morning after the sun comes up or while the sun's rising. The plants are active. They'll suck up the water they need. And then any excess water will have a chance to dry before the nighttime comes, which is when a lot of diseases get active on, in moist foliage. We want to water deeply. We don't want to water frequently. If we, the roots will grow where the water is. If we water deep, the roots grow deep. 
if we water, let's say, every night or every other day, and just a, and just shallowly, the roots will stay near the surface. They won't grow deep, and they'll be subject to drought stress. Also, mulching is a great tool for us in North Dakota. I'll talk about that more later. We want to prevent pests, OK? One, week, one way we can prevent pests, and any type of pest, whether it's an insect or a bunny rabbit a or a deer, the best way to control pests is a physical barrier. So here we got a floating row cover over our planting, shielding our plants from insects, a physical barrier. Another way we can control pests is by controlling weeds, because insect pests like to live in weeds. And lastly, remove crop residue, because that also will um, attract insect pests. Last step is to avoid routine spraying. You know, like don't don't decide, okay, I'm, I spray after church every Sunday. Don't do that. Okay, go, it's good to go to church every Sunday, but don't spray after church. Because what happens is that most of the insects in our backyard garden are good for us or neutral. So when you spray every Sunday or whatever, you spray on a routine basis, you're killing more good insects than bad insects. So who, who has an idea what insect pest this is? Any, anybody want to type in a guess? OK, these are stages of ladybugs, OK? It's a, nymphal, a larval and a nymphal stage of a ladybug. And so when you see this pest, actually, there are friends. There you go, Diana. Great. And um, so what about ladybugs? I was taught ladybugs are the gardener's best friend. So should I go ahead and should I like buy boxes of ladybugs? No, you do not buy ladybugs. It's a crazy idea. You c ladybugs are your best friend, but you cannot buy friendship. It does not work. Sorry, it doesn't work. I learned that a long time ago. OK. Not that everyone's had any money. <laughs> That's the problem. But when you buy a box of ladybugs, the ladybugs you bought were hibernating. They were hibernating in huge clusters, and they were harvested. When these ladybugs are released in your garden, they're not hungry. Instead, they want to burn off their fat layer before they start eating. So when you put ladybugs in your garden, they want to burn off their fat layer before they start eating any other pest. So with studies have shown that after 24 hours of releasing a box of ladybugs, this is how many remain. One. That's right. They're all gone. And the only reason why this ladybug's still there is because it has broken wings. It can't fly. So don't buy ladybugs. It's a total waste of money. Nevertheless, we still have insect problems. and so. We need to address these. And like some insects like this, like uh, you look at this cabbage worm, you know, like some other types of larvae, they got amazing appetites. They can eat like two times their weight every day. You know, that's like, that's like if you're a teenager, a teenage boy, that's like going to McDonald's and saying, okay, I'll, I'll have 200 Big Macs and 200 large order of fries and oh, maybe throwing about 50 salads for my good nutrition. You know, they got amazing appetites, and so you need to take action to defend your planting. And there are natural insecticides out there, like insecticidal soap, for example. The, the limitation with soap, though, is that you have to physically spray the pest itself to work. There's products like BT, this natural bacterium, and uh, Dipel and Thuricide are common insecticides with this. BT, spinosad, neem, these natural insecticides are all effective against these types of caterpillars. <clears throat> but the problem is they're slow acting. It can take a couple days for the insect to die. Now maybe that maybe that appeals to you, okay? That you know you want to punish this ladybug and you believe in or this is this cabbage worm and you want to suffer for a couple days before it dies. So maybe you know that's a good thing. But on the other hand, a lot of us, we like we're what I call dirty, hairy gardeners, Clint Eastwood types that, you know, you mess around with my garden, you caterpillar, you worm. You're going down. You're going down now. 
And so that's why I'm going to get, get out that old carbril, the number one insecticide in gardens, sevens trade name, or pyrethrin. And you can shoot that on that cabbage worm, and you can just sit back and enjoy. You can watch that cabbage worm drop to the ground, and if you're lucky, you can see a few nervous convulsions and watch it suffer before it croaks before your eyes. So that's, you know, that's a very powerful feeling of revenge here, and that can be very appealing to gardeners including myself. But again, this is a powerful weapon and you've got to use it judiciously, okay? And you've got to follow the label carefully because they're toxic, okay? So that's a loaded weapon you got there. Use it judiciously. How about our friend the bunny rabbit? You know, when I was a kid, I thought bunny rabbit, I was taught they're friendly and they're nice. You know, the Easter bunny came, gave me candy, Bunnies are good, they're gentle, but then I became a full-fledged gardener and I saw the true personality, the true heart of a bunny rabbit is evil. Bunny rabbits are the enemy because they will destroy your garden overnight. So, you know, some of us think, oh, let's put some marigolds around the garden, they'll do it. That doesn't stop rabbits at all. There's only one surefire way to control bunny rabbits. There you go. There you go. You can use your imagination. That could uh, that could be uh, lead poisoning, as some people call it, or maybe blood meal may have some limit, limited benefit. Or you can use a fence, like you see here. And uh, the eastern cottontails we got out in the eastern part of the state, you need at least a three-foot-tall fence. And jackrabbits, which we had throughout the state, and especially the west, more like a four-foot fence is what we need, okay, or a couple. Wow, okay, Julie, I like your attitude there. Get some dogs out there to protect your garden. How about, does anybody have any questions about in insects or bunny rabbits or before we move on? Okay, I'm going to go through the rest quickly here. We want to control weeds, and the key is control weeds when they're young. There are chemical and uh, weed herbicides and triforolin, also known as preen, is a widely available product, and there's natural products like corn gluten meal. And then, of course, there's mulch, and let's talk about that. Todd talked about mulch a little bit earlier. There's all kinds of mulch out there, clear, black, red. There's IRT, infrared transmitting mulch. There's silver mulch, straw mulch, clear mulch will generate the most heat, and it uses like the greenhouse effect. So if we want to get our plants off to a quick start, clear mulch will generate the most heat. So you can see these cucumber rows side by side at, in, on campus in Fargo. You can see the row under the mulch is already blooming and much more established than the, the row right next to it that's not under mulch. But the problem is, like Todd mentioned this earlier last week, was that sometimes, you know, if you have a weed-infested garden, the uh, mulch, you can have weeds grow underneath the mulch, and so that can be a concern. And that's the reason why black plastic, the second one there, is more commonly used. It will generate heat, and also any weeds that do emerge underneath the mulch will die because they don't get any sunlight. But the key about black mulch, to get the good heat transmission, is you have to have it smooth and taut against the ground to come into contact with the ground. Because if there's gaps there between the mulch and the ground, you're going to lose a lot of heat there. There are studies that show like <coughs> red plastic mulch is best for members of the tomato family, just because of the special wavelength that's reflected. And again, there's all kinds of mulches out there, um, and so investigate that. Let me just throw a couple. The IRT looks looks promising. That means an IRT mulch allows the infrared to go through so you get that nice uh, greenhouse effect going, but since it's brown or dark green, the weeds won't, the weeds won't have a chance to get, uh, to get going because um, they'll be smothered, they won't get the light that they need to, to grow. So the IRT mulches are, are getting popular now. Okay, silver mulching doesn't, is mainly good, uh, is more used in, in warmer climates. And straw too. Straw does not generate heat, so we're going to put that on later in, this, in the year. 
Okay, as we get wrap it up here, prevent diseases. We want to use disease-resistant cultivars. Space plants properly. Um, if you see diseased laser plants, we can get them out of the garden, and there are fungicides available to protect against the spread of the disease. But again, I really like using disease-resistant cultivars to, as your best defense. There's powdery mildew. We have varieties that resist this naturally. Harvest regularly. You know, we talk about zucchini. You know, some one zucchini, two zucchini. That's great. But, but we want more zucchini, right? Now, I know this is where I'm supposed to insert uh, the joke here about too much zucchini, how we got to lock our car doors in the summertime, otherwise our neighbor's going to put zucchini in it and all that. But I have to say that zucchini deserves more respect from us gardeners, okay? It needs more respect because why don't we respect a vegetable that's so productive? We should honor zucchini. The problem is not the zucchini plant. The problem is us. We just don't know what to do with it. And it's such a multi-use vegetable. Zucchini, we can cook it, but also we can use it like, when I was a kid, we used it as a baseball bat, our big zucchinis. You can carve a zucchini out and make it into a canoe zucchini float. We can have race boat races down the Missouri River with zucchini. And then also, there's another strategy, and that's we talk about the, the legend of Montana Maggie. Montana Maggie once, she had, this is a true story. Maggie was a gardener, and she was in her house, and all of a sudden, their bear came to her property and started eating seed out of the bird feeder box. Her dog got so mad about that, so the dog started barking, bark, 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 getting, trying, to, trying to defend the, the bird seed box. Well, Maggie heard the dog bark, and so Maggie went out to the deck there, looking out at the backyard and, and saw the bear and goes, shoo, bear, shoo, you get out of here, bear, you get out of here. And all of a sudden, the bear didn't like Maggie, didn't like that. So the bear started coming, charging right at Maggie. So there's Maggie on her deck, racing through the door, and t here's the bear's face right there, halfway through the door. Maggie's there, you know, she's, she's trying to reach on the kitchen counter. Is there a knife or something she needs to defend herself? No, there wasn't a knife. She just grabbed something. She grabbed a zucchini. She bought the bear, and the bear ran away. So zucchini, what a great crop. You can even defend yourself with zucchini. But if you want to have lots of zucchini, you've got to keep harvesting regularly. The last point is you want to extend the season. Okay, and we frost and come early, so a blanket of protection uh, or even a double layer is even better, just like with us. When my mom taught me, you know, put on two coats or put on a sweater and a coat, use layers, they'll give you even more protection. Or take advantage of cool season vegetables. And, you know, for example, kale is getting very popular now, and this can grow in temperatures in the low 20s. I've seen it even survive snow. So take advantage of that. So I want to thank the photos. The people who took the photos for this presentation and asked, does anybody have any questions before we wrap it up for today? I see Michelle's a question, putting straw around fruit trees, keep the ground colder. Okay, uh, that's, yes, Michelle, a straw around trees will keep the ground cooler and, and help to reduce premature blooming. But instead of putting straw, I would recommend that you use uh, shredded bark mulching. And then you can keep it there. Because, you know, one problem if you use straw is straw can attract rodents. And rodents will be drawn to those fruit trees and especially they can gnaw on the bark. So use shredded bark mulch instead to do this and have it minimal bark near the trunk and build it out to about three inches or so. Uh, got a lot of questions about slugs. Yeah, there's uh, there's uh, two ways. The most common way. To, okay, the most common, uh, most commonly used way is uh, uh, is it iron phosphate or iron iron phosphide? I want to say iron phosphate. And one product is called Sluggo. It's a natural way to control slugs, um, especially in a, in a place where we're going to grow vegetables. The more toxic sluggicides or molluscicides like metaldehyde 
um, and I'll just type that in real quick, metaldehyde, that's used in more ornamental plantings. Okay, sluggo, there you go. Um, I think sluggo is one of those iron phosphate products. Um, the other way, of course, there's that old beer trick, right? You can, slugs are attracted to yeast, and so you can put out a pine tin, a shallow pie tin, and maybe bury it in the ground a little bit, and then this, put some stale beer in there, and then the slugs will come in there, and they'll die from that overnight. Another strategy, a diatomaceous earth is sometimes used, and that is spread along the perimeter of the garden. That can help. Um, even like put out a, a wood, uh, like a one by eight board, and then at night the slugs will go, um, after they're done feeding, they will go under the board because they'll be cool and moist here. Then in the morning you just pick up the board and you can scoop up the slugs that way. Good questions. Any other questions? Okay. I will hop in and I'm going to thank Tom for the entertaining and very educational session today. I popped in the, the survey link, so please take a minute or two to fill out the survey. And don't forget to show up next week. We should have another entertaining and educational session featuring Todd Weinman. I have, I have a fun job. I get to work with a lot of cool people. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Thank you, everybody out there. I really appreciated it.